Showcasing local talent, professionals, and everyday people making Salt Lake City what it is today. It's time for another episode of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. I want to welcome everybody out today to episode 226 of I Am Salt Lake podcast. My name's Chris Hollifield. I am your host. Welcome to the show, everybody. Welcome to a special midweek episode. Something a little bit different here with I Am Salt Lake. This kind of heads back to the old school days when I used to put out two episodes a week. You know, I've been chatting with so many people here in Salt Lake City, so many people that are doing really cool things, making the city a better place. I've gotten a little backlogged with conversations, so I wanted to get a get a midweek episode out, something for you to listen to uh, before the weekend hits. Today on the podcast is a live recording that I did at Connect on May 13th. This is a live recording with Jimmy Toro. Uh, we talked about art, the maturity of art, how to value your art, and uh, just some great tips that uh, artists and non-artists can value from and learn from. Uh, and then there were some little conversations that I did with Chris Madsen and Blake Palmer. We chatted, I chatted with them before the conversation with Jimmy Toro, but I'm putting them at the end of this episode. So you're going to want to make sure to uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, Before we do get into the live recording at Connect, I want to tell you about the show sponsors, Oleo Skin and Beard, great local company from Salt Lake City here. Oleoskin.com is their website. You can head over there, check out all their products. They're making some fantastic beard oils, beard washes, beard balms, skin oils, face washes, you know, everything to get your beard nice and soft, your face nice and clean, and your skin nice and soft. Uh, you're going to want to head over to oleoskin.com. Use the promo code I am Salt Lake at checkout. This is going to give you 25% off of your entire purchase just for purchasing it right there at oleoskin.com. Use the promo code I am Salt Lake at checkout. Check them out. Great local company. I love them. You know, if you've been listening to the last few episodes of the podcast, I've told you about a brand new podcast called City Stories. You're going to want to check this out. It's a a great podcast. It helps potential movers understand the cities that they're headed to. The best part, they're starting right here in Salt Lake City. They have a great pilot episode. Just search City Stories in iTunes subscribe, download it, give it a listen. This is going to, I mean, this gives you a great overview of what you can expect with all the upcoming podcasts, uh, where they're going to be talking about the different Salt Lake City neighborhoods, the gay culture here in Salt Lake City, the Silicon Slopes phenomenon. Again, search City Stories in iTunes, subscribe. You can review it right there. Give Salt Lake City a great name by reviewing it there in iTunes. You can also check it out by going to soundcloud.com slash city stories. Listen to it right there. The podcast is produced by move.org. And again, the website soundcloud.com slash city stories. Give it a listen. And I want to thank them for uh, sponsoring I Am Salt Lake podcast. Like I said, uh, this episode is the live recording for Connect that we did on May 13th at Urban Arts Gallery in the Gateway Mall. A little bit about Connect is every month they hold a free open call arts event where all visual artists can engage with their community. Artists have an opportunity to show up to two pieces of their original art, win a portion of a $4,000 grant, and listen to art professionals on how to make it in the art world. Connect is a program of the Utah Arts Alliance. Like I said, Jimmy Toro's on this episode. After we're done chatting with Jimmy Toro, uh, I had a little conversation with uh, Chris Madsen and Blake Palmer about art. So you're going to want to make sure to stay tuned to that. Anyway, here's a live recording from the May 13th Connect. Uh, I want to welcome everybody out tonight uh, to Connect. I don't know if how many people here have um, been to one of the live podcast recordings I've done here. This is the third month I've done it, and uh, each one's a lot of fun. Get a chance to uh, chat with somebody different and uh, get their perspective on art and uh, creativity. Um, So tonight, I'm going to be chatting with uh, Jimmy Toro, and we're going to open it up to audience questions. Anytime uh, throughout the conversation, 
if anybody in the audience wants to chime in, if they want to uh, kind of give an idea they have or, or ask us a question, there is a microphone over here. Just come, come on up and st state your name and um, ask a question. Pretty simple. Uh, this will be up on uh, I Am Salt Lake uh, podcast, IamSaltLake.com. Uh, you could subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher Radio, wherever you can find podcasts. And uh, if anybody has any questions for me, you can chat with me after or, or during. And um, so with that being said, uh, how you doing, Jimmy? Is your microphone on there? Let's test Hello. It. There you go. There you go. We're going to start, I mean, just even for, for the sake of the recording, um, let's, let's get an opportunity to get to know Jimmy a little bit, uh, kind of as an artist. Uh, when, when did you start creating art? When did you start that whole journey? Okay, see, he has a qu list of questions here. We're going to take those away. All right. So we'll just go from here. I like that. All right. I like that. Okay, so could I ask them something? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. See how I deflected that question? <laughs> um, so I'm not the kind of guy who likes to talk and ask simple questions and then write them on a board and, you know, what's important about art? And, you know, you raise your hand and I write down an answer. I'm also not the kind of guy who likes to ask for a show of hands and then kind of ignore that and go on to something else. But what I would like to do is get from the audience something. So usually, I've been doing art forever, my whole life, and um, I was teaching a bunch of kids up in Park City, the Kimball Arts Festival, a couple weeks ago, and I asked them, do you know the word, what the word prolific means? And they didn't know what that meant. And I had to remind them it meant that you do something a lot all the time. You produce a whole lot in a short amount of time. And uh, so I was telling them to be prolific. Okay. To do a lot. You're going to learn more about art by doing it a lot than you will any other way. Right? And so what I want to... I do want to get a show of hands from anybody who's interested in art or is an artist, whatever, here. Um, would you want to talk more about... If, if I asked you um, to define yourself, to define your success as an artist, you could look at it different ways. You could say, well, let's talk about financial success. If I'm not making money as an artist, I don't feel I'm successful. Or you could say, no, let's talk about my art. Um, if you look at any given piece of art on the wall, you could, you could look at it and say, well, that art is, is, is good or that art is not good. And there is actually good art and not good art. Not all art is subjective. And... So you can be successful as an artist, meaning your art can mature and get better and better and better and better and better. And you could define your success that way rather than financially. Or you could design, define your success as an artist financially. I want to make so much money doing this thing that I'm passionate about in a, you know, in a given time, given year or whatever. So would you want to hear or talk more about the financial success side of art or the artist's maturing of your art so since you're the guy see if you can get that out of him <laughs> you heard him which would you like to hear about more, art. more more about the art and not the finance okay great we're gonna do that well you took my questions away I know <laughs> so Chris right yeah Okay, what would... Chris is not an artist, from what I can No, tell. I'm, I'm not an artist at all. And uh, so, Chris, if you, as a non-artist, would, would ask me a question about how do you tell if art is mature or not, what might you ask me? If art is mature? Yeah. So let me explain. If you, as an artist, do a piece of art... And you take it into a gallery owner, and the gallery owner says, well, what should we sell this art for? You've got to put some value to it, right? So how do you know what to value it at? 
Well, okay, so let's, let's say you say, well, this piece is worth $3,000 because I put my whole heart and soul into this. I spent so many hours doing this piece, and it means so much to me. The gallery owner isn't really going to care. Why? Because he has no, he has no attachment to it. He has no attachment to you to it. The gallery owner sees that art as sellable or not sellable at a certain price. Sure. And a lot of gallery owners and art dealers and art buyers are not artists. And yet many of them can see value in art more than some younger artist starting out. And so if you looked at all the art in the world, it has value. Most of it has no value, right? So, so who decides that it has value? The buyers. True. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Right. So I could do a piece, and I could um, think it's the best thing in the world, and I own it and this and that. But if I can't sell it, or nobody will buy it, you know, not counting my grandma or anybody, right? It, it only has value to me and maybe some friends. It just doesn't have any value otherwise, right? Correct, yeah. Okay, so... I don't know whose art this is on the wall here, and I don't know if, if you're here, but I'm going to pick on you if you're not, if you are or not. Okay. So let's take that piece right there, Nikki Cox. Is Nikki Cox here? I can say more. <laughs> no. <laughs> really? no. I can look at that piece, and it's not judging that piece up or down or this and that. It's just, it's just a reality check. I can look at that piece, and I can say my opinion whether that would sell for a certain amount or not right I think it is for sale it says $375 is it worth $375 to the artist but that's not the point right is it worth $375 to the buyer and how did the artist determine that price did they determine it on the value of the maturity of their art or the rarity of their art or how many people collect or want their art? Or did they, did they determine it? Um, who knows what they determined it on? So I was given a, a presentation not long ago and I had several artists up here and I had them calculate the price of their art per square foot. So if you look at that and you say well, there's maybe four square feet there, just under $400, right? That's $100 a square foot. Okay. Then I had another person, their art's not here anymore, young artist starting out, and he calculated his art, and it was like seven, $800 a square foot. And I asked him, why is your art seven, $800 a square foot, and this person's art is only $100 a square foot? And there's another kid who was in the same discussion whose art was $25 a square foot. So I was teaching these kids, and these kids are like 14, 16, 18, and after doing some fun art stuff with them, I, I picked up all their pieces. And I said, well, what will you sell this to me for? They didn't have a clue, right? And I finally got answers out of them, like $20, $10, right? And this and that. So how is it that a, a serious art buyer or a gallery owner or an artist who's, who's, who's put in a lot of time can look at a certain piece of art and give it a certain value? And how do you know as an artist where, where, when you've reached that point? So when I was younger, I was reading this. I, I like art history. Uh, this one artist, um, Maxwell, I think. And um, he said that he didn't consider an artist a real artist until they had done a thousand paintings. And I was young, and I was, I've always been an artist all my whole life. You know, I always thought I was good. And I thought, how dare he say that? I haven't done a thousand paintings. This is in my 20s or something. And yet he's telling me that you're not a real artist until you've done a thousand paintings. And now that I've matured and gotten better, I actually agree with him. So sometime in the process of doing your art, you will go through these phases where something will click. I Meaning you could do the same thing like for years and then something will click. Sorry, I'm hogging all his time. He's no, not getting to good. say much. Good. I, I'm loving this. Okay. Who, know, who has heard of an artist named Mark Rothko? Anybody? One taker? You've heard of Rothko? 
Okay, so if you go to a museum like in New York, you know, a big fancy place, and you might see these massive paintings that are usually really big, and it's like um, a big black painting with a yellow rectangle. That's it. Anybody seen that kind of art? Or two rectangles, right? That's Mark Rothko. That's what he's famous for, those paintings. So he was born in the early 1900s. He died around 1970. He was 66 when he died, which isn't really that old. It wasn't until his 50s, and he was a full-time artist his whole life. It wasn't until his 50s that he arrived. And so if you're an artist and you're 20 years old and you think you've arrived or you think your art is really that good, chances are you've got a, long, a lot longer to go and a lot more to explore and a lot more to learn from. So, I think there are two types of artists out there. There's the artist that can paint a duck and paint a duck and paint a duck their whole life. My wife's back there. She has an uncle who paints ducks. And he's really, really good. He goes out into the wild and he studies those ducks like you wouldn't believe. And he paints them perfect. And his day that he arrived as an artist is when one of his duck paintings got put on a postage stamp. And he's happy painting ducks. And he will be till the day he dies. Then you have the other types of artists, like famous, like Picasso, who get bored with what they're doing and they want to try something else. And they want to try something else. I had a lady last year fly in from Texas and she wanted me to tell her or teach her or nudge her how I could get her out of her painting stale position, <laughs> whatever she was doing. She, she, she was painting these portraits and if you take a portrait and you paint it photorealism, it looks like exactly the person, right? And you say, okay, what do I do next? Okay, I'm going to go to something slightly impressionistic, right? I'm going to use fewer brush strokes. And it's not going to be total photorealism. Photo okay, now that I've done that for a year, I'm going to do what? Cubism? Surrealism? You know, this Mark Rothko guy, he tried all that stuff. He lived in the era of like Salvador Dali, Picasso, Miro, those guys. And he went through all those, those phases of this, this ism and that ism and, and such and such. And so this lady was stuck. She, she could figure, her portraits kind of had a little bit of an impressionistic to them, but she could not figure out how to go to the next step. She couldn't figure out how to do anything different. She was stuck in her impressionistic portrait realm, right? So we had fun. I had her close her eyes and draw, and she, I had her mess up a painting. I had her do some things, and she was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. And, and it was just like breaking her out of this little rut that she was in, right? So, so how, how many artists that... When's the last time you've been to an art gallery or an exhibit or anything and seen a piece of art and said, wow, I've never seen anything like that before? Since we have some extroverts here, when was that and where was it and what was it? Uh, Is there any way we could get you up here? In the mic? And we're going to actually need to take a break here in just one second. Uh, Michael's going to make the announcements for the awards. But just for the sake of the recording, I want the people uh, that listen to this later to be able to hear this. Uh, state your name. What's your name? Buddy? My name is John Wendling. Cool. Uh, in March, I was in Ireland and went through some of their national gallery. They had a painting I really liked, and, and actually the people of Ireland had voted on their most liked painting you know, that has been done, and uh, they voted for this painting, and it was kind of like uh, pre-Raphaelite type, and the lady was standing there like kind of pushing the the soldier away and he was hugging her arm and so, so was it the was it the style or the color or the emotional message what got you I think it was a message a message uh-huh what message it was conveying a, an emotion what what emotion did it convey in you 
um, love and rejection. And you've never seen anything like that before? Yeah, but I, I just think, uh, uh, to me, I enjoy paintings that I can walk away and I carry a feeling with me for, for a very long time. Okay. That's what makes me uh, like a painting. Okay. Thank you. Is there any way we could take that? Uh, let's take a quick break, like I said, with Michael, and then we'll come back, Jimmy. Okay. I'm liking where this is going. I'm liking right, where this is great. going. So uh, Michael's just giving me the, uh, the, the death evil eye. eye. The <laughs> evil eye. I think the funniest part is how in uh, setting up for this uh, show, Jimmy said how great the questions were. <laughs> and then he just... Yeah, th those were Michael's questions. He, he wrote them out for I've me. I've covered a few of these, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just teasing. Um, did anybody... I, we were talking about uh, uh, art, right? Feeling emotions and... and uh, anybody else uh, want to chime in where we left off there? Or we'll, we can jump into it. I got a question for you. Sure. As an artist... Why do you think we're afraid of like failure and and not succeeding? Why do you think we? Why, why do you think artists or anybody who creates, for that matter? I'm not. You're not afraid of it? No. Ever? No. How did you get to that point? Mess up a lot. I. I maybe some artists are. I'm not. I've, I've messed up so many things. Are you afraid of failure in any aspect of your life? <laughs> I'm sure I am somewhere. <laughs> not, not in a big way, no. no so, but yeah, I, I guess there are artists who are, and I, you know, uh, now you're getting, you know, now I need to get on a couch and listen to you. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just asking a question. It's more of a. I don't think. I don't think that's necessarily a fair statement for artists. I think everybody experiences failure, no matter what they do. I don't. I think artists aren't that unique in that manner. It, you know what artists have to do to make a living and to be successful is sort of unique in the business world. You know, you don't sell art the same way, way you sell a shoe or a, a, you know, software. So it's different that way. And the term "starving artist" is a good is a real term. You know, there are a lot of artists who don't know how to make money. So, but I don't. I don't why, why do you think that is? Why do you think some do and some don't? I have no idea. But I do have a fun exercise I want to do. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So, is there anybody here left here who can draw? Who can who can who can draw realistic like realism? To, to some degree, sketch or draw, you can? All right, can you come up here? Please. And for, and for people, it, we'll, we'll have to try to figure out a way for the audio recording of this. Uh, okay, you can do like a play-by-play, -play, what's going okay, on. Okay, we'll do a play-by-play -play here. Okay, so what I'm going to have her do is, it'll only take a few seconds. I'm going to have you look at somebody in the audience and draw them with your, whoa, wait, wait, with your eyes closed. Oh. <laughs> and, and just do it really quickly. So take this pen, okay. take this paper, you can put it on the chair and do it. Just look at somebody for a few seconds and then close your eyes and do not cheat because if you cheat, it won't work. Okay. Okay. okay Just, yeah, and do a line drawing. Draw the, draw the face. Draw the face. Draw the f basic features, the eyes, nose, ears, mouth. Awesome. I think she's drawing one of you guys. <laughs> Don't look. It sounds like you. See it? Okay, you done? Okay. Don't let me see. Okay, now I need somebody who's not an artist who's, who, who claims they cannot draw. Anybody in the audience uh, want to step forward? <laughs> All right, perfect. All right. And, and what's your name? Oh, yes, you doesn't, can. It doesn't matter. This is Betty. Betty. Yes. Betty's going to draw okay. for us here. Look at somebody. Close your eyes and draw. So you can do a play-by-play. -play. Well, what did we got? Well, she's drawing uh, with her eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> but she's drawing a human face. A human face, somebody that she saw, somebody she pictured in her mind. Thank you, Betty. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
one of these is not necessarily better than the other, is it? Why do you think that is? What is it about these that a non-artist and a trained artist who knows proportion and all this kind of stuff and anybody? Perspective? Chrissy in the audience instead? Perspective how? Right, but right, but why did both of them execute something that turned out about the same? Want to take? Is there any way okay, we can get you? you up? I, I, just for the recording, this I just want this to be able to be somewhat listenable. Okay, you're a viewer. What's your perspective on why? If if you didn't know either one was what, you couldn't tell who was the trained artist and who was the not. So which one do you like better? This one? Why? Because it has more... Yeah, I, just, I just want some people to be able to listen to this at home. I think because it has more expression and it's very linear and it, it's saying something What's it to saying? the audience. Um, what is it saying to you? <laughs> <laughs> I think... Uh, Happy emotion. Thank you. Okay, I don't want to just get up here and blab, 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 talk, talk, talk. I thought I would like to do something practical. No, I love it. That I maybe love it. I if just you're want to be able to an <laughs> artist or you want to explore, you could actually run away and try this. I spent a long, t- a lot of time drawing with my eyes closed, and 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 the point wasn't to get better at it. The point wasn't to be to be able to draw with my eyes closed and produce realism art. That wasn't the point. The point was, um, I have three kids. When my kids were really little, they drew like this. And if, they, if I said to my little daughter, Hannah, hey, Hannah, draw a horse. And she drew a horse, it came out like this. And then she says, Daddy, you draw a horse. And if I drew a horse that looked like this, she wouldn't stand for it. She says, no, that doesn't look like a horse. I'm like, well, what about your horse? <laughs> <laughs> and the point is, is that there's a... As I think as we get six or seven or eight years old, if we stay with art, we want to learn realism, perspective, and shading, all this kind of stuff, which is great. And what I would challenge you is to figure out how to deconstruct your art to go back to that child that all of us have. And so Betty, or Beth, or whoever I called her, <laughs> Teresa, from an artist's perspective, has never left that which is great. So, there's an idea. I don't know how you say that in radio, how you show that in radio. Uh, we could probably take a picture of that and, and post it even on the website so people that are listening can even see what uh, the different perspective, uh, different drawings okay. of them, if that works for you. Sure. That's great. How much more time do we have? Uh, we've got a few minutes. Anything more you want to say or mention about art or... Okay, so um, here's what I challenge you to do if you're a young artist. Or not young in age, but you could be 50 and start art. If you're a young artist in the number of hours that you've been producing art, is educate yourself on the difference between not so mature art and mature art. And try to figure it out. When you go to a gallery, don't be shy. And if you see a piece of art on the wall that's selling for $20,000 and it's this big, and there's another piece over there that's a lot bigger selling for $2,000, inquire why. Now, some of that is just Hollywood, you know, somebody slept with somebody and they know somebody and da-da-da, so their art's famous. But most art doesn't fit into that kind of odd category. Most art actually has a rhyme or reason to it. And chances are the, the more mature... The, be- the art is the more suffering if you will that an artist puts the more struggle that artist puts into their work it just gets better and better and better and better and oddly enough a lot of young artists don't see that and a lot of serious art buyers and serious gallery owners they recognize it they see it they, they easily they can look at a piece and say it's not there I'm not interested in it and that's often why they would be interested in your work or not. 
and they and they it's, it's I knew a girl in high school she could she she was like a fashion nista <laughs> she was really good she could walk down an aisle of clothes in a, in a clothing store and they're on hangers and she'd walk at a pace a fast pace and just going like this with her fingers and she'd go 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 stop and grab something she was that good she could see it and she could see what worked for her fashion wise she was really good at it and good gallery owners and art buyers and art dealers and people who they 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 could literally walk through this whole place and point out one piece of art out of everything in just a fraction of a second say this art is good the rest is not it's not a slam it's not it's not sometimes it's hard when an artist comes up to me and and, and asks me that question you know like if if this artist that's your logo (laughs) if (laughs) if this artist showed me that piece I don't know who this artist is Sometimes it's hard to be, because it sounds like you're being mean. But in my opinion, that art has got some work to go. It would never get anywhere. But I don't know the story of that artist. I don't know who it is. And, and, but, anyways, so you just, you, it, you've got to figure this out. If you get stuck in a rut, so I had a lady come to me literally about a month ago. She's painting these ducks and cows and, you know, traditional very traditional, traditional stuff. Little paintings about so big. And she brought this cow head by. And I asked her, what's her name, Carolee? I asked her, Carolee, how long did this take you to do? Well, it took probably several hours, half a day, whatever. Okay, I want you to take this same painting, scrap it, and go back and do the same painting and literally do it in 15 minutes. Literally. She freaked. She could not do it. She, the anxiety, you could see it coming, you know, going over her face. But eventually, you know, because I'm a nice guy, uh, she did it. And she came back, and she was so proud of it. And it was, to me, it was better. There was something really loose. It wasn't perfected by any means. There were a lot of flaws in it. But if she would take that simple idea, I, I did this years ago. It's like bungee jumping. You know, you get all prepared, and you get all ready for it. You go to the edge, of, you read all about it, you talk to people who bungee jumped, and, and then you get all ready, and then you jump, Right. So I had that idea. Okay, so I took these sunflowers, and I, and I got all my paints ready, and I kind of had in my mind's eye. I took my time. And then, then I, as soon as I executed, I went as fast as I could. And I think it was in 10, 10, 10 minutes. You know, I was literally sweating. <laughs> I was like way into it. And I learned something valuable in that. It was really, it, it's not a piece that's going to hang in a gallery one day. But it's something I learned. And I'm learning that even today, and that was like 20 years ago. And so try drawing with your eyes closed. Try drawing real fast. Try doing things that are, that are outside of your element. Um, when I was teaching these kids at the Kimball Art Center a couple weeks ago, I had them all draw a face, and they drew it like pencil, and it was pretty careful and this and that, and they are all kind of proud of it. It was just charcoal and paper. And so I got some oil, like linseed oil, and I said, okay, now each one of you, I want you to dip your fingers in this oil, because if you take oil on charcoal, it smears. It gets really black. It really messes with it. And I want you to take that, and in one simple stroke, you can't do two strokes or three strokes, or be careful. One stroke, you can do one finger, you can put it on the palm of your hand, you can dip your whole hand in it, I don't care, and do one stroke across your little picture that you drew. Man, I was like asking them to sacrifice (laughs) something, you know. But they did it, and about three quarters of them really liked what came out. And I asked them, why do you like it? And to your point, their answers were emotional, driven. It was pretty fun. I like it. So go mess up your art. <laughs> Does anybody, we have a few more minutes. I'd love to, uh, if anybody has any questions about anything that, we, that Jimmy's talked about tonight, I, if anybody in the audience, if you want to come up here, and it's Dawn, right? Yeah. Dawn, yeah, we were chatting earlier. So do you think the key is like the whole thousand painting things, right? That you work and you work and you work and you work on technique and then eventually you get to a point where you've perfected or, you know, you got your technique down and then you just kind of throw it out the window and you're pouring your emotion into it and no longer thinking about the technique. Do you think that's the key to mature art? Uh, yes and no. I, I, don't, I don't believe that you ever throw out your learning out the window, even though you might think you are. I don't think you ever do. 
I mean, you could literally do watercolor your whole life, beautiful ships, and then stop one day, and you're off doing cubism, right? Something in all that is going to transfer, transfer over, which is beautiful. So I don't know when, but at some point, you'll start to, you'll start to see your art move. Something will move about it. And hopefully, before you leave this earth, your art will become something that adds to all the art that's out there and it's not just a copy of it. And you can see that transition through art history, from realism to impressionism to surrealism to cubism. By the time this Rothko came along, you know, he'd done all the isms and then he's doing these rec- rectangle things, right? There are huge paintings. He said, yeah, you should stand 18 inches in front of them so it feels like the paint is wrapping around you. And it's pretty cool stuff, right? Well, right after him came Andy Warhol and pop art. He hated it. <laughs> I'm like, why do you hate this? See my point. So study the master. Study what they do. Try little tricks like I did. Your eyes closed, messing up your art. Doing. If if you're that kind of artist, you're not a duck artist, right? I'm not what? A duck artist. Oh. You don't just paint ducks your whole life, and you're happy. Okay. So yeah, try things. I. Th- if if you try enough things and you're prolific enough and you're aware. Um, I am aware of all kinds of artists. I, you see them online. Whenever I see something interesting, I grab it, and I have a whole folder on my computer of art that I like and things that, oh, how did he do that, or how did she do that? And I literally try it, and that's where I screw up a lot. But I get better and better and better, and finally I hit upon something that there's magic. And I don't know how to describe the magic. It just, it just is there. But it only comes from all those hours. So I would not suggest, but it's up to you, I wouldn't suggest just taking what the path you've done and trying to do a 180. I would say take the path you've done and mess it, mess with it, tweak with it, alter it. Okay, it's one one man's one man's opinion. Anybody else in the audience have any questions? We're done. We're done. Um, <laughs> All right, Jimmy. For people listening to this uh, yes. that might not be familiar with you, yes. Do you have a website or any anywhere that Jimmy, you want? Jimmy J I M M I Toro dot com. My art's the stuff right behind the counter. Okay, so you can come down here to the uh, gallery and check it out. Yeah, and uh, thank you so much, Jimmy. You're welcome. Thank you. You bet. All right. All right, guys. It's a wrap. That's it. <laughs> For the sake of the recording, why don't you start with your name? My name is Chris Madsen. Chris Madsen. How long have you uh, been creating art? Uh, I've been or, doing it for about six years now. Okay. What, uh, I mean, I, I've seen your art at like different festivals around town. Uh, what is your uh, preferred medium? Like what, uh, what, do, you, what do you like it's to do? definitely photography. Photography. And then I use a lot of alternative methods like wet plate photography or... Or cyanotype or Van Dyke Brown. Uh, I do some wax encaustics over photography. So how, what got you into photography then? Let's back up a little bit there. Social media is kind of what got me into it. I would go on and I would see these guys who were photographers. And they seemed to always be surrounded by beautiful women. <laughs> so that and was so, like your dream. Yeah, and that I was thought, what you wanted. I thought, that's it. I'm going to get a camera. I'm going to start shooting the real sexy Playboy style images. Uh, and it didn't really work out. I found kind of discovered art and kind of more emotional art and and kind of changed my direction in life and just really started pursuing it. What, uh, what, where do you find inspiration, like when, uh, when you need to be inspired? To I get create? a lot of inspiration from uh, like early French Renaissance work. Really? Yeah. Right on. Any Anything in particular or any... Uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, Michelangelo and Picasso, uh, Boguru. Uh, yeah, I mean, it'd be a lot. And then also you, a lot yeah. of photographers like Sally Mann. Right is on. a big inspiration. What do you do like when, you, when you're just like, when you just can't find any inspiration, when you're just kind of down in the dumps and you're just like, okay. That actually I, happens a lot. Uh, sometimes I just have to take a little break. Okay. And kind of start to crave it again. Um, and I often, also, I have a, a lot of music that I'll go to that really, I mean, I find music like, very, like very inspiring. bands, musicians. Yeah. Any in particular? Uh, Stephen Wilson 
is a, is a pretty big influence. Uh, a lot of Tool and Pucifer. Nice. Uh, even like lately, it's been a little bit of CCR and uh, Poison the Well, Wolf Alice. It, it, it kind of changed a little, but I get a lot of inspiration and motivation from music. How long have you been growing the beard? I think I asked you that one time. Uh, right? You know, I got to ask I'm you. On, I got a guy with a beard two and a half has years to, now. <clears throat> two and a half years. You yeah. cut it at all? Yeah, I've cut it a few times. Trimmed it? Yeah, trimmed yeah, it. Yeah, I trimmed mine up. Uh, I kind of regret it, though, now. You know, there's a part of me. I was like, oh, okay, just a little bit longer. You About know? every two or three weeks, I pick up the clippers, and I'm ready to take the thing off. Really? And just shave it off yeah. completely? It's going to happen one of these days, but you kind of get attached to them. <laughs> you do. <laughs> and then everybody around you, that yeah. your identity and your... Uh, what, uh, what, would you, what advice would you give to somebody that wants to start creating? Like maybe whether it's art or photography, do you have any advice? The biggest advice is to just do it and be yeah. prolific. Uh, just keep doing it. You get better the more you do the... You know, the more you practice, and in a sense, I feel like most days I'm still just practicing. Um, it's not something that there's a shortcut. Sure. To just keep doing it. Um, is this your first time at Connect? No. No, you, you've been I've, yeah, you've I've, done it I've a handful won of times. Connect right? three times. Really? Yeah. Well, right on, man. Yeah. Well, any uh, actually, okay. Let's say this for uh, people listening: How can people find your uh, work? Uh, you have a website or yeah, I have a uh, website. It's burningpaperhearts dot com, um, and then there's also a schedule there. I travel around to a lot of festivals. I just came back from six weeks in Texas. Uh, I'll be doing the Utah Arts Festival this year. So check you out there yeah. for people listening. Yeah, when is, when, is, when is the Utah? That's the end of June, right? End of June. Yeah, 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 man. Well, cool. Thanks so much for sitting down and chatting for a few minutes. Yeah, you bet. Awesome. All right. Uh, I guess for the recording, we'll s- state your name. Right. Uh, I'm Blake Palmer. Blake Palmer. How you doing tonight? You you have uh, some art here tonight. Yep. I got two pieces. Um, doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. <laughs> doing good. Doing good. Just kind of chatting with uh, people here tonight, kind of discussing art and maybe what inspires them and... and uh, uh, get to know them a little bit better. Right. So how long have you been... Uh, creating art for um officially or unofficially <laughs> both <laughs> um your whole life pretty much my whole life my mom still get as a piece in uh her bedroom that's i guess in grade school somewhere we're studying a uh, surat and i tried to make a surat and it looks kind of morbid but it's it's there and it's it's so your mom still has my it. mom still has it and it's a uh, it's a uh, it looks like the, the walk in a park by Surratt, and it's a, a section of it, and there's a guy missing his head, and there's another guy looks like he's holding something underneath of his arm. I don't know what's going on, per se. I don't remember making it, but obviously I made it. <laughs> what if somebody came to you today and they wanted to pay you a lot of money for that piece? Would you sell it? I wouldn't. It'd be up to my mom, and she probably wouldn't let it go. <laughs> <laughs> what is your, like, do you have, like, a preferred medium that you like to work with? Um... Pretty much everything. So I'm mostly mixed media. Um, I love to just create with anything I can get my hands on to. Um, I'm pretty much, yeah, partial to that. I haven't really done much with oils. Um, I think the only reason why is just because I'm scared I'll actually like it. <laughs> um, and it's kind of on the expensive side. Not that what I do isn't expensive either. But <laughs> What do you do when you're, you find yourself... Uh, unmotivated you know to find motivation when you when you're like i can't create i feel like there's no more in me that's a really good question it's been like that for actually for a little while now um it's it's a good struggle i i went through a few things i i said i'm going i'm going to take a break from art and uh i had uh took an about two three year break i was still doing my graphic design so i mean there's still some art but the but making art for myself or, you know, to pin a show or something like that, I just didn't do anything of, really. And it was really hard to get back involved in it. And I've been struggling with all kinds of different ways of doing it. Um, everything from 
practicing um, old techniques to give myself challenges to create something within so many minutes to doing all kinds of other things and just grabbing things and creating and trying new mediums and um, whether it was just trash at the end of the day or, you know, if I thought so or not, but other people may not, I don't know. But, you know, just just creating and just grabbing whatever you can next to you, glue, um, picking up pinstriping out of a blue, I don't know. So um, you felt that taking a break was beneficial? Um, it was pretty damaging, I think. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, it was... Because um, you always hear that. You hear, take a break, it helps you refocus. Yeah. I, we figure out who you are. Right. What you want to do. It's, I think it maybe have helped a little bit, but it's been a lot harder picking it back up. Um, it did not, like, it's it's not just like riding a bike. At least it wasn't for me and just hopping back on and, sure. and pulling a, a 360 like you used to. It's getting around like a, <laughs> you know. Half you get full. older and you're just like, exactly. Gosh, you, know? you, you, you pull a 180 and you land on your face. <laughs> it's a couple times. And then you start figuring it out and remembering some of the me- mechanics. It's similar to that, at least for me. And yes, I have new looks on things, but trying to get back to my, I'm very unpolished, I feel like, um, for me. And it's something that's that's struggled, is struggled trying to come up with a theme um, and going off of that theme and keep working on stuff. And. But you're getting back out there now, yes, man. You're I doing am. it. I'm doing it now. I've got a show coming up in November at FICE, so I'm excited about that. Um, I applied to the Urban Art Festival, so we'll see on that. I think today was the deadline. Um, so, any any advice for people uh, that are starting, like that are just getting uh, into the art world, that are starting to create, starting to paint, starting to draw? Just. Start trying things. Yeah. It's it's if you don't know what kind of medium you like, just start messing with all kinds of different mediums. Um, don't get discouraged. Um, find things that you like that are out there in the world. Take pictures of buildings, whatever it might be, and draw off those influences and just continue to create. And it's it's something that's it it takes practice and honing those those. Um, those, skills. those ideas, yeah, those yeah, skills, yeah. 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 And it's, is there a, a website or anything that people could see your stuff at? Or? Um, yeah, I've got an old website that I need to update, which I'm in the process of, I think, soon. Uh, it's finalsketches.com. And then, of course, my Facebook, uh, Blake Palmer, I think, is cool. what it is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> cool, man. Anything you want to add? or, or I think or, No, just, just thanks for having me here. You bet, man. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, many thanks uh, to Jimmy Toro, Blake Palmer, and Chris Manson for coming on this episode of uh, the podcast. Great time recording with them. Again, this is something that I'm doing every month, the second Friday at the Urban Arts Gallery. It's part of Connect, like I said. Uh, it's The podcast portion starts roughly about 8 o'clock, but show up at about 7 that we could check out all the art, connect with the artists. And I get to know some of the local artists here in Salt Lake City. It's free to the public. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. You can uh, send me a tweet at I am Salt Lake. Ask me more about Connect. Uh, again, the website for the podcast is IamSaltLake.com. Head on over there. Listen to all the previous episodes right there on online, right there on the website. You could subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher Radio, however you listen to podcasts. There is a donate button right there on the website. Feel free to uh, donate a dollar or two. Helps keep the podcast moving forward. You know, I started this podcast close to four years ago. This is just kind of a passion project that I'm uh, doing to kind of, you know, spotlight some of the cool people here in Salt Lake City, you know, and, and funding it out of my own pocket. It's uh, bec- become a little exhausting. And, uh, you know, a dollar or two from the listeners to kind of help keep the show going forward. It uh, it goes a long ways, and it means a lot to me, those of you that have uh, been supporting the podcast and uh, kind of help keep the, the ball rolling with there. So again, I Am Salt Lake is the website. You can find the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, really every social media outlet. We're right there. Uh, connect with me. Uh, again, my email is chris at IamSaltLake.com. You know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff going to happen here in the uh, world of I Am Salt Lake. Listen back to the last episode, episode 225 with uh, New Transit Direction. At the end of it, we kind of 
uh, Chrissy and myself gave a little bit of an update on some things that you can expect uh, with some future podcast episodes. So keep your eyes peeled for that. So anyway, that's going to do it. Uh, we'll see you on Sunday with a brand new episode, I believe, on Sunday's episodes with Form of Rocket. Great conversation that I had with a local band here in Salt Lake City. So you're going to want to come back and check that out. You all have a great rest of the week, and we'll chat with you again soon. Bye now.